Okay. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this morning. Um, thank you, God, for uh, this uh, time where we can learn and uh, learn from your word, God. I pray that uh, you would just uh, help us, Lord, to take in and that uh, when we hear your word, God, it's like a seed that is planted in us. And God, I pray that it would just grow and that it would produce fruit, God. Um, thank you, uh, Jesus, for helping uh, even... Uh, Pastor Deepika, she teaches us your word, God. Um, give her the words to say and uh, the wisdom. Uh, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Oh, yes. Um, we are almost done with Ephesians. So today we will cover chapters 5 and 6. Um, yeah. Uh, now... Um, the midterm uh, assessments I will try and post sometime during this week, at least maybe by the end of the week. Um, so Galatians and Ephesians is what you would have as your portion for the midterm assessment. And um, maybe I would give a time limit of maybe three weeks or so. You know, so the, the, the you mean you will you will have more than enough time, and moreover, it's just multiple choice questions. So you just have to tick the you know correct answer. And um, the only condition that is laid is that students are not supposed to consult each other and just take the answers from each other. Um, apart from that, you are allowed to look at your notes. You're allowed to look at your Bible. You're allowed to uh, you know, um, go back to the videos and uh, see if the answer is there in the video. You can do all of that uh, because the idea is that um, you, you kind of revise you know during this whole exercise, during the midterm assessment, you kind of get to revise the uh, all the things that have been covered so far. And you also, um, um, you can also assess yourself and see how much you have, you know, grasped and retained of the um, theory part of it. So uh, um, I will try to put up the midterm assessment. Um, at least by the end of this week. So it will be on the e-platform as well. Uh, so uh, for those who know who would be watching it, um, uh, who would be attempting this, um, uh, this thing later. Uh, so yeah, so you know, just kind of uh, keep an eye on that. And whenever that thing is posted, you can open it and start working on it. All right, uh, so uh, we are now in Ephesians chapter five. At the end of chapter four, we kind of looked at, um, yeah, we, we didn't have time to look last time, but actually the, the last portion of uh, chapter four is where, you know, uh, Paul now comes to the practical instructions for Christian living. So in the last portion, he starts off by saying uh, that you need to put off your uh, old self in the sense he means Put off your former way of life. That's the wording that is used in NIV, actually. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 to, uh, to 23, he says, you know, put off your former way of life. So don't go back to the things that you used to do earlier. But rather, he says, put on a new self. And in fact, he explains what, what he means by a new self. He's talking about a renewed mind, uh, a renewed perspective. So you consciously choose to put on a new mind. You choose to think the way Christ would think. You align your thinking to scriptures. Uh, you do all of that. So, um, so he says, uh, in different practical ways, every single day, you choose to put off your former lifestyle, your former way of living, your former way of responding to things. And now you put on a new self, you know, which looks at everything, uh, approaches everything, through scripture, uh, you think, uh, you ask yourself, how would you know Jesus deal with this? And you respond accordingly. Uh, so he gives some practical instructions on um, you know, how a, a, a believer would be putting on their new self. So he talks about how we should not lie to each other. Uh, he talks about um, how when we are angry, we should not allow that anger to grow into you know, wrong, sinful attitudes. He talks about the importance of working hard and sincerely rather than you know, stealing uh, the way some of them used to do earlier. Um, so he talks about all of those practical things. And then in chapter 5, 
he continues with those instructions. Okay, so chapter five uh, kind of continues these practical instructions. Uh, and there is a slight uh, emphasis on uh, the attitude that we should have even as we are doing these things, because he's kind of moving into um, moving into instructions on how people should be interacting with each other, you know, in a family setup. And so uh, he he introduces this new idea of what kind of an attitude you, uh, we should be having, even as we, uh, you know, take up our Christian walk. Uh, so we'll kind of look at that. Um, yeah. What do we okay? Um well, yeah, I hope that Kennedy is able to log in once again and be able to hear what is being said. Well, um, yeah, yeah, he's 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 a he's come back. Hopefully, Kennedy, you're able to hear now. I really hope so. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, nice good. Nice. Okay, that's a relief. Okay. All right. Yeah. So if we can have someone read out for us uh, Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. Can I read faster? Yeah. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Yeah. Uh, so he starts off now by saying that we should be uh, following God's example. And uh, how, in what way are we to follow God's example? By walking in the way of love. You know, there's a way, or there's a selfish way to walk, and there is the way of love, uh, you know, that we can use to walk our daily lives. So he says you adopt this kind of a the way of love. Now, what is this way of love that Christ adopted? Uh, you know, um, just to kind of um, reflect on that. Uh, it says uh, Christ loved us, gave himself up for us. So it's talking about how even though Jesus Christ was entitled uh, legally, legitimately to having certain rights and privileges, he gave himself up, it says, you know, he, he gave up all of those things for our sakes, so that, you know, he could sacrifice himself for us. So the way of love, even though it is entitled, even though the person is entitled to something, you know, legally, um, that is the privilege which they have been given, it belongs to them. But they choose to give up those privileges. They choose to give up those rights to instead walk in the way of love, where they are placing the other person's interests you know, before their own interests. So um, uh, if we, you know, if we were to look at um, OK, maybe we can get to that later. You know, because you have this Philippians passage, right, where it talks about how, um, you know, um, Jesus Christ, even though he was equal with God, he still chooses to humble himself. Okay, he chooses to... Okay, we'll get into that a little later, maybe when we are talking about this whole uh, passage about how Christ submitted to the Lord and all of that. Um, all right. So if for now, it's in, it's enough if we can you know think about the way of love as being a, a way where you choose to give up your rights and your privileges, and you make you sacrifice those things for the benefit of others, for the you know well-being of other people. Uh, so when we do that, it says that um, that is like a fragrant offering to the Lord. So the sacrifices that you are willingly making uh, just to help other people, just to benefit other people, uh, those sacrifices are like a fragrant offering that you're giving to the Lord. So we, we are, so in following all these instructions which are now given, uh, you know, uh, chapter 5 onwards, 
this is the basic attitude that we would be adopting, where we would choose to act in uh, the way of love. Um, yeah. So if we can have someone read out uh, you know, these instructions, there are quite a few of them. We can maybe go all the way from, chap uh, from yeah, verse 3 up to verse 7. Because there's something very important being mentioned over here. So I think maybe it's good for us to read these particular instructions. Uh, verse 3 to verse 7, please. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it be not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filth, filthness nor the nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving giving of thanks. But this you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God, a kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not you, therefore, the partakers with them. Mm. Now, this particular passage is saying a lot of things. And um, yeah, you know, uh, at least for this particular passage, maybe a simpler English would have helped uh, because the words which are used in the KJV, we would not even understand what those words are meaning in our you know, current day English. Uh, so he's basically targeting three specific kinds of sin over here. And in fact, he says, that you know, even if a believer, because you see, he's right, very much talking to believers over here. He says a believer who is indulging in these three things, you know, there's a danger that he may not inherit the kingdom of Christ. So it's something very serious that he's talking about over here. And um, uh, you know, if we were to look at it, uh, look at these three things um, using the other you know Bible translations where the wording is more simple, we see that he is targeting. Uh, you know, he says there must not be even a hint. You know, it's, it's the, it says in, 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 in NIV, there should not even be a hint of these three things. And what are these three things? One, of course, is sexual immorality. And then it goes on to say any kind of impurity, the second one. And the third one is uh, greed. So, and then the same thing is repeated again in verse 5, the same those th same three things. It talks about immorality, again it talks about impurity, and it talks about greed. And in verse 5 it explains uh, the reason that such a person you know, um, may not even inherit the kingdom of Christ is because these three things are equal to idolatry. Uh, these three things are almost equal to idol worship. So. A person knows, you know, that if they turn their back on Jesus Christ and they go back to worshiping the idols, you know, that they used to worship uh, earlier, it's a very clear indication that they no longer want to be uh, part of Christ. So um, we know idolatry would obviously not be regarded as something acceptable by the Lord. So here, um, Paul is saying these three things, if you do them, that is also equal to idolatry and you are in danger. So he says, you, there should not even be a hint of these three things in your life. Okay, so he's, uh, that's the warning that he's issuing. Sexual immorality, we know, you know, uh, any uh, any sinful action that is going against the, um, the, the, the commandments that are set down in the Bible, you know, uh, regarding sexual relationships and all of that. But what does it mean? Uh, the, what does the second one mean? It's where it just says any kind of impurity. So over here, I think any kind of impurity is talking about uh, the things which are mentioned in verse 4, where the person has not committed an, uh, an, an act of immorality, uh, but uh, other things, things which are indecent or offensive, you know, like... Um, uh, here in verse 4, it talks about, you know, cheap talk, uh, where, um, you know, uh, coarse jokes are being used. So that kind of uh, offensive, indecent talk and actions, uh, you know, um, even, even maybe dressing, cheap form of dressing, um, you know, all of those things uh, 
I mean, by doing those things, how are we representing ourselves? You know, if we are showing ourselves as being part of the world, and we are doing this on a habitual, regular basis because our conscience is not even pricking us regarding these things. It goes to show that maybe we have, you know, turned our back completely on the Lord and His ways and what He regards as good. So it it warns us against immorality. This uh, this passage warns us against um, other kinds of impurity. And the third is greed, uh, where uh, your obsession with something uh, is is so strong that you love that thing more than you love the lord and usually of course greed you know um, is is what we would use uh, with re with reference to money with reference to status uh, with reference to uh, material things you know so you you gather all those things just to show yourself as being great you gather all those things because you love material things and um, uh, you're welcome i mean you're, you're ready to even you know uh, bend the the lord's um, commands just to accumulate those things so when we indulge in these three things um, paul wants that it's almost equal to idolatry and, and so uh, uh, we are told in verse 5, um, for of this you can be sure, you know, it's the wording used over there, of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And then in verse 6, it goes on to say, let no one deceive you with empty words. Okay, so people may, you know, argue and say these are very human things these three things are very human it's like humans are programmed to you know do these three things so if you slip up in these three areas it's all right it's a human thing to do it's it's an okay thing to do you know it's what people may can uh, come and say to us and so here paul warns in in verse 6 and he says let no one deceive you with empty words you know because whatever they may be saying to support the, this kind of activity, the fact remains that God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient in these areas. So people who are indulging in these things are automatically under the judgment of God, um, irrespective of what kind of words and arguments they are using to support what they are doing. So these, these three kinds of sin are insupportable. Whatever argument you may use to back up what you are doing, the fact remains that God's judgment is literally hovering upon the uh, people who are doing these three things. And therefore, he says, do not be partners with them. So if there are people who are kind of, you know, excusing this kind of activity and saying that it is OK, that it is all right, then it is better for us to break our partnership with them so that they don't drag us into sin and you know, literally drag us into hell along with them. It's it's a rather serious matter. Uh, so, so this this very strict warning is given uh, after he talks about how we should be living in the way of love. So, one of the things about the way of love is this: where we choose to sacrifice anything which would even give a hint of these three things. We completely cut ourselves from the, from such things. We sacrifice all of such things so that uh, we would be like a fragrant offering to the Lord. And then he goes on to talk about you know uh, relationships in the family. Uh, so you have another few you know instructions given there, uh, but then you know just quickly to get into the uh, uh, verses twenty one onwards. Um, so maybe we could have one person read out verses twenty one to twenty four, please. If someone could please read out verses twenty one to twenty four. So meet to one another out of reverence for Christ. Why so meet yourselves? Hus own husband as you do to the Lord for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church his body of which he is the savior now as the church submits to Christ so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything Amen. yeah 
so this section on you know relationships uh, in the family it starts off with this with these words verse 21 where it says submit to one another okay so it here here very specifically it's talking about husbands and wives and it says submit to one another and why should you be doing that why should you submit to one another out of reverence for christ so then it goes on to talk about the wife submitting to the husband so art verses 21 and the other verses which follow contradicting each other because we get the impression from verse 22 onwards that it's only the wife who should be submitting but the opening words the very opening sentence it says submit to one another as though god is saying that even um, the husband should in a way submit now it does not seem to make sense it almost looks like a contradiction and uh, so it kind of helps us to understand uh, in terms of jesus christ and his relationship with the church just to understand in what sense you know jesus christ submitted uh, so yeah maybe now we could kind of you know bring in that philippians chapter 2 passage and look at um, how jesus christ dealt with this whole uh, issue of submission and we see that right it's just mainly a, a very sacrificial thing that he does an act of service that he does so if we could have someone read out for us philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 8 philippians 2 5 to 8 please Philippians 2 5. Uh, Let this be in mind in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Yeah. We, if someone uh, could also read out Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Mark 10, 45. Hey, Pastor? Yeah. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for. All right, it's for many. Okay, yeah. Um, so here we see, uh, you know, in Philippians chapter two, verse five, uh, it almost is saying the same thing which you know we we just saw in Ephesians. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. In Ephesians, it says, have the same way of love which Christ is using. So that's the way we should be conducting our relationships. And then it goes on to explain in verse 6 that Jesus Christ was in the very nature God. He was equal with God. And knowing fully that he is equal with God, you know, with, with God the Father, he chooses to submit to God the Father. Okay, so status-wise, he is completely equal to the Father and fully knowing what his status is, he voluntarily chooses to submit to the Father. And to what extent does he submit to him? You know, it, it goes on to say uh, that, um, yeah, he, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. And so he it says, uh, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a doulos. Okay, so NIV tries to avoid the word slave in a whole bunch of places. And um, maybe because it maybe NIV people feel that, you know, we will kind of get the wrong idea if the word slave is used uh, because slaves were not uh, treated in the way they were, you know, in the USA back then when they had that, um, in that whole system of uh, human slavery. So maybe NIV people are worried that when we think of the word slave, we would think of uh, slavery in that kind of a sense, because slaves back in uh, biblical times were not really um, uh, considered as something lower or something really bad. In fact, if you look, you know, Abraham, if Abraham had not had a child, 
his slave would have inherited all of his property so the slaves were almost like family members uh, who has who have you know pledged themselves to 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 serve and be part of that household for the rest of their lives so um a slave is not necessarily a bad thing but a slave is in complete utter total submission uh, to um, to the master in the sense they are not going to get paid uh, so they are dependent on the master for their food supply they are dependent on the master for all decision making uh, so um, in that sense they have no freedom of their own they are completely dependent and at the mercy and under the you know um, uh, control of their masters and so over here jesus christ uh, he, he he empties himself to the extent that he takes on the very nature of a slave so jesus christ in status he knows that he is completely equal with the father and knowing his status having full awareness of his equal status he voluntarily chooses to submit himself to the father to the extent that he becomes almost like a slave and having become a slave choosing voluntarily choosing to become a slave and you know uh, um, to be someone who is serving he serves to the point he humbles himself to the point of death you know we looked in in galatians how the the most degrading kind of uh, punishment that was available at that time in that society was the death of the cross no one would even like to mention the word cross because it was considered a, a bad word and uh, jesus was willing to humble himself to that extent so this is the mindset that we are being asked to have in our relationships so it says in philippians chapter 2 verse 5 in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as christ jesus and we also looked in mark 10:45 uh, where, where where it is explained to us that what was the mindset of of this uh, of this jesus christ it says this son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life so he did not come to be served but he came to serve and to give his life um, so in that sense even the husband over here is being asked to submit so um, the husband chooses to serve his wife um, because he recognizes uh, that he is the slave of Jesus Christ. Okay, so in that sense, all humans, I mean, all believers, uh, okay, yeah, humans, I suppose they are under the slavery of, um, you know, unbelievers are under the slavery of sin and Satan. Uh, but we believers are supposed to be slaves you know uh, paul uses the term bond servant um, at least that, that's the english translation uh, it just basically means slave uh, so um, believers are supposed to be the slaves of jesus christ so the husband recognizes his uh, who he is he recognizes that he has volunteered to become uh, you know nobody forced him right at the point of salvation it's a choice that he made he said yes now onwards i choose to uh, you know have jesus christ as my master and i will be his willing slave so he recognizes his uh, this position that he has voluntarily taken upon himself to be uh, a slave to jesus christ and so it uh, you know um, like it says in uh, ephesians chapter 5 verse 21 out of reverence for his master out of reverence for jesus christ he chooses to submit to the to christ and serve his wife in the same way the wife of course is instruct is also instructed to uh, to show reverence to her master jesus christ by submitting to her husband in all things so both of them are doing this submitting to one another recognizing the fact that they both are slaves of jesus christ and they must revere him in the way they uh, treat one another so the whole um, uh, all that all that it all that is said in that passage rests upon this basic fact that they are doing it out of reverence for their lord and master jesus christ okay so um um so uh, 
if we uh, yeah, yeah yeah from there if we move on into the next verse um yeah maybe we can look at the rest of the verses and then you know we'll connect the whole thing together so if someone could read out verses 25 to 28 please 25 to 28 Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, a husband should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wives loves himself. Okay, so here it is explained, it goes on to explain how the uh, husband is serving his wife and in how, how she is supposed to be submitting to him. So uh, the explanation for that is given by comparing uh, the relationship that Jesus Christ has with the church. So we see that Jesus Christ, he serves the church um, to edify it, to build it up. It talks about how he has cleansed it and he, uh, you know, how he has presented uh, the, the, the church to himself as a radiant church. Um, so uh, he has chosen to sacrificially build up the church. In the same way, the husband over here is urged to serve his wife in such a way that he edifies her, that he builds her up. So um, his main uh, function is supposed to be to serve her in such a way that she is built up uh, so that she is you know blessed and benefited um on the other hand you know uh, the the wife now what is uh, what is her role it is supposed to be the same role as that of the church if the church says lord we don't want to abide in you we don't want to submit to you we don't want to cooperate with you then the Lord is unable to edify us, right? So we choose to submit to him. We choose to cooperate with him so that he can edify us, so that he can build us up. So we understand, we realize that what God has in his heart for us is, is godly and good. And we willingly choose to submit and cooperate uh, with Jesus Christ so that he can uh, you know, bless us and build us up. Now, here we are told that the wife should, uh, you know, have the same attitude. Um, I suppose that will come in. Not able to find the exact verse. Um, just a minute. Verse 28. What's your your mute. I am so sorry. Um, yeah, it must have got muted on its own. So yeah, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, the last verse, it says, you know, a wife should respect her husband. Uh, so not only is she, is she submitting to him, it's the attitude with which she submits. Okay, so um, the church does not submit to Christ grudgingly, uh, you know, resenting him, um, you know, being angry with him. We do it out of an attitude of trust. We trust our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. And so trustingly, with deep respect, uh, you know, we submit to uh, whatever he says. And so here, the wife is uh, being asked to submit with that kind of an attitude of respect. Um, now, uh, having understood this, the husband should be selfless. He must serve. 
and he must serve to build up his wife and having understood that the wife must uh, you know submit and cooperate so that he the you know so that the husband is able to build her up you know he cannot do that if she is refusing to cooperate and so in fact she's harming herself if she does not submit so it is good for her to submit and trust and respect her husband so that he's able to uh, you know fulfill his role of serving the entire family you know so um, they need to cooperate with each other in doing this but what happens you know if uh, you know a person a couple is in a marriage where the husband is completely self centered and he is not at all interested in serving his wife or any of the family members he only thinks about his own interests or what if he is violent you know or what if he is that kind of a person then uh, what would the wife do you know she would continue to have reverence for christ you know because the opening line that's what it said right uh, we submit to one another out of reverence for christ so she continues to um be submissive uh, and show respect to her husband out of reverence for jesus christ and he is the one who will you know edify her and build her up the husband is failing to do his part he was supposed to be the instrument through which you know god would build up the wife and edify her and all of that but now he is unwilling to cooperate the husband is not cooperating he is uh, you know um ungodly or maybe he is not even a believer uh, so she just continues to perform her role she continues being you know submissive and respectful in her attitude knowing that the lord will take care so the lord will edify her and build her up in the same way what does a you know um what does a husband do you know if his wife is uh, refusing to cooperate uh, if she is being very domineering and she is being very disrespectful uh he chooses to continue serving lovingly uh because out of reverence for christ so he just continues you know performing his role and then you know because of his uh, um obedient attitude towards jesus christ the lord will build up his home the man it would have been much easier for him to build up his home if he had his wife's cooperation you know if if he could you know take decisions for the family with her active support but if she is being domineering if she is being disrespectful and she is not cooperating he is going to find it difficult to you know build up his home build up his family take the decisions for the family because she he does not have a cooperation but because he is continuing to maintain an attitude of law of, of love the lord will you no know, build up that family he will help he will intervene so um the husband and wife can have this deep assurance that law as long as they are living in reverence to jesus christ jesus christ will take care uh so the one exception you know which is usually mentioned is you know with regard to the wife if you know, if her life is in physical danger if she is being you know um uh, violently being uh, physically uh, you know attacked then it is good for her to leave she no longer has to submit to physical abuse you know she uh, she has the freedom to leave and seek protection elsewhere or in, in fact she has the right to even take legal action to protect herself so in that case submission is not required and the other exception which is always mentioned is um that is that if the husband is asking her to do something which goes against biblical values again in that case she would not submit because she would submit to jesus christ and whatever he has said so if the husband is saying you know um don't pay the taxes you know uh, you know um show false figures and asking her to bend you know scriptural principles in some way she would say no in this in these things i cannot submit because i must stand up for uh jesus christ out of reverence for him okay so um so except for these you know the, these uh, two things where she would uh, not need to submit it would be good if she can be respectful you know in 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 other things trusting jesus christ trusting him to take care of whatever lack there may be the same with you know even the husband whatever lack there may be in his wife he chooses to continue doing his role because he trusts that jesus christ will ultimately take care of his family uh, so um, 
uh, we need to have that kind of an attitude of uh, obedience and um, you know trust uh, then in the next chapter it talks about relationships with, uh, with with children you know the relationships between parents and children and um, that um, maybe we can have someone read out versus one to three yeah someone could please read out one two and three children obey your parents and the lord for this is right honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with a promise so it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth amen so it says here that this is the first commandment with a promise uh, so if the children choose to obey their parents then it says that it will go well with them god will see to it that everything goes well with them uh, so um, children are meant to obey the lord and uh, then it goes on to say in verse to honor your father and mother so as the children grow up as they stand on their own feet and they learn to you know support themselves and um, they move out of the family unit now they are no longer under the um, what full control uh, and authority of their parents so at that point of time they may choose to obey certain things and they may choose not to obey certain things because now they are you know accountable to god directly they are now running their own families uh, so um, so they may no longer obey their parents uh, in all kinds of decision making but they would have to continue honoring them so when it comes to younger children who are still under the authority of the parents uh, uh, they would have to obey them uh, in everything but after they stand on their own feet and they are no longer under the parents covering but now you know they're directly accountable to god and they are under his covering then um, they may not obey any longer in all the decisions that the parents you know take but they would have to continue maintaining an attitude of honoring the parents so if they if younger children and the grown up children have this right attitude it says god will see to it that everything goes well for them and that they would enjoy a long life you know so that's the promise that is uh, made uh, yes uh, brother shay go ahead yeah. um i actually have three questions but i'll just let me just uh stick to one or two let me just say two um verse chapter six so it says uh, children obey your your parents in the lord um i have heard some preachers say um this is parents spiritual parents in the lord now I, I do not negate the fact that this is not just restricted to biological parents well i want to say literally from scripture um does this mean in the lord pertaining to things that align with christ we should obey or does this mean parents who are termed to be spiritual parents that we obey them um i i, I don't know which, which of them and then in that case therefore um how does a child or how do children um the, the, which is my second question how do children you know navigate their way um with their parents who are unbelievers yet they still have to obey them but there are certain things they're told to do that are completely opposite of the expectations of christ how does such a person still obey honor their father and mother in this case there's just two questions I know. thank you yeah so yeah of course you know uh, what you said is right because over here it very clearly says obey your parents in the lord so anything that the lord does not approve of uh, and the parents are asking you to do something that is not approved by god then obviously you would not you know need to obey in those things so you would only obey your parents in the lord as long as the things that they are asking is in line with the scripture 
uh, you would obey uh, for instance you know especially in in our indian context where you have um, you know um, people from uh, you know idolatrous backgrounds uh, so if if the parents are saying you know you have to go and do the puja you know you have to participate in the idol worship then uh, you know the the children can say can choose to say no i will not participate in this because now i have become a follower of jesus christ uh, so they would not obey uh, those things which are uh, not in the lord and um, um, regarding um, sp spiritual parents um here this particular passage you know if we look at the overall context is very much talking about um, a biological family but of course the principles apply uh, because you have other bible passages which talks about how we need to you know uh, submit to those who have been placed in authority over us in the church setup so yes in in that sense we do submit to those who are above us uh, who have been placed by the lord himself above us you know in the church setup and uh, they are imparting to us in that sense they are spiritual parents uh, but we wouldn't take this particular passage and apply that uh, you know to, to 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 those church relationships uh, because it kind of gets complicated then because you see in a family unit those children are under the covering of the parents and uh, the the parents are the ones who are slogging day and night and providing for them and taking care of them and these children have a responsibility towards those parents they can't be going around doing their own thing um in a church setup you know you we all are kind of uh, under um the mentoring of our spiritual parents and leaders uh, but then we all run our own family units and we take decisions you know regarding personal matters on our own i mean uh, no church leader should actually come to us and order us and say uh, you know what i don't think your family should be going on this particular holiday i think all of you just come and sit in the church and you know fast and pray it's a choice that you would make with your family whether you want to go ahead on your vacation or you want to or you want to join in the church you know uh, prayer um, for that particular month so uh, church leaders big who begin to interfere in all kinds of personal matters saying that i am your spiritual parent and so you must do what i say um, that becomes a little bit dicey so i would not use this particular passage uh, to talk about spiritual uh, parenting uh, here it's talking about kids who are you know living in that parents home and those parents are doing their best to be godly parents and provide for those kids and and all of that those kids have an obligation to their parents they must respect them they must obey them uh, they so one day when that child grows up and you know stands on his own feet and goes and gets a job and he says you know see now i'm living on my own i have my own family unit fine you know now he's a grown up let him continue to honor his parents but he can take his own decisions you know which job to take up which city to move to you know if the parents say no no you have to stay in the same city with us he can choose you know prayerfully whether to either you know take their advice or he chooses to move out so um i would prefer to use this passage only for uh, biological families because when you start applying it too much to uh spiritual parents and the entire church setup it could get very complicated um it it could open the door for spiritual leaders misusing their spiritual authority and uh, that is the reason why i would not use this passage in that context um uh, yeah we have another person charles raising his hand um yeah maybe you can ask your question and then we'll take a break you know and then we can you know, discuss the answer after that go ahead yes uh it's not a question pastor <coughs> excuse me can you hear me oh perfectly yeah go ahead okay uh, it's not a question but uh, i was trying to respond to what christopher was asking i think it was christopher about children uh, or being their parents and whether they are spiritual children, uh, parents or biological parents. The whole thing is coming from the Old Testament in the book of Exodus. Um, Moses receiving the, the tablets and bringing and the first command that has 
has a promise is that command of children obeying their parents. And now when Paul says in the Lord, uh, it continues to be parents that are biological. But now what the children are supposed to obey are godly. For instance, uh, when you have a child um, and then you, you tell a child, maybe you are a man and you tell your, your, your child that come and we sleep as husband and wife. Yes, the child is supposed to obey you, but that is not godly. Then that means you, the child will not obey that, will disobey that. So um, the things that uh, Paul is talking about, that children obeying your parents in the Lord, it is in that perspective that they are doing things that are going to give God the glory. But also when it comes to the spiritual parents, even when they become spiritual parents, then, and they are going to do something that uh, is ungodly, then the children are not supposed to obey. We have had some of the pastors who are sleeping with the, the people they are ministering to. Therefore, they, they are not supposed to do that. Uh, you are giving an example of a wife who is supposed to obey the, the husband, but in the Lord again, if a husband tells the wife that you do not pay taxes, the, hus the wife will not do that. They will, the wife will be able to pay taxes because it's an example of obeying the authorities. So that's my input that I wanted to put across about children obeying the, the, the parents in the Lord. I submit. Very true, because the same principles apply, you know, uh, uh, when it comes to spiritual parenting as well. So only if it is something in the Lord that they are advising, uh, then, you know, we choose to act on that. Uh, just to kind of, you know, point out, uh, in, in, in spiritual parenting, it's the advice which they are giving. They can't issue commands and orders. That would not be right. Uh, you know, um, there's a limit to spiritual parenting. You can't order and command. You're talking to grown-ups who are responsible to the Lord. Uh, so it would be, there are limits and boundaries which spiritual parents should maintain. They should not become uh, dictators controlling the people that God has placed under them. So, um, yeah. yeah. We'll go for a break and we will, uh, you know, come, okay, we kind of... I've eaten up into your time. So, you know, if we can all log back in at 10.3, okay? At 10.3, we will log back in. Thank you. Yeah. 